Welcome to the Intellectual Adventure Podcast. Today I'd like to welcome you into a discussion about education. We're going to be talking about the different fundamental changes we've seen implemented in high school since Cactus and I have both been involved. Cactus and I are the only active members today in this episode, but we will have more panel members next week as uh, less technical difficulties are going to be apparent uh, with power issues and different things. Thank you for understanding and we really hope you enjoyed today's episode on the intellectual adventure. How have the times changed since you went to high school? That's the question we're framing today. And I come with my perspective being behind the American education system. Cactus here comes from Canada and we'll be bringing a different perspective I'm not even familiar with. So I'm excited for this discussion ahead. Our co-host here, Cactus, would like to say a few words before we begin. Hi there. Welcome to another episode of the Intellectual Adventure Podcast. I'm joined today by my co-host, Cameron Skelly. And as he said before, we're going to be discussing how things changed in the high school system and the educational system since I've left, since the times passed that we've left high school. I've got the Canadian perspective. He's got the Amer- American perspective. And with that, I feel as though we're going to be bringing some interesting points to the discussion, especially given that I was in high school just over 10 years ago now, and I dropped out of high school. So I'll have some interesting points on that, different things of that are relating to the education system and how I feel it failed me, how I feel it's set up for success in the future, and a couple different points down the road. But before we get into any of that, we'll jump back to Cameron to finish introducing the show. Thank you, Cactus. I've been uh, away from the high school education system for about four and a half years. I have been able to talk to people that had high school education in the 70s, 80s, 90s. A lot of the time, sometimes, you know, you get those older gentlemen or ladies that have the, the older experience, but it's rare that they fully remember details, too. Uh, from that that age you kind of have to talk to people in in a closer time for uh relevancy to the the more present current state of the education system at least in america it's it is very standardized and it has been similar for a long time so there's always going to be things that you can draw from that experience but it's not going to be the same in the aspect that the times have changed society's changed along with it and the things that are okay to do in school maybe in the 70s or 60s just aren't going to fly these days in every situation you know pranks that's a really good example senior prank yeah. day i know in a lot of places has been banned <laughs> because there were problems you know people took it too far they they yeah, uh, yeah. Did it for the meme. A lot of people would say, and uh, I would say it, it definitely makes it to a point where we don't have direct control over what others do, but we have control how we interact with the tools around us. So, education's ultimately, I think, something. I just wanted to frame this out before we really dive into it. Something to keep in mind is education's as good as you make it. Uh, the the tools that you have around you are as good as or as as effective as effective as you can manage to make them. And it's not always easy to understand, but it's very rewarding too. And I come with a perspective of having not all the tools of public education system that the big cities have, um, which has a, I definitely, it makes a difference compared to some people in the urban environments. Um, I don't think for the purpose of this discussion is going to change too much because there's statistics that are across the board, but 
as far as my local experience, keep that in mind with my perspective that we're dealing with schools of a few hundred students, not a few thousand. And the environment that the students endured is a lot different than some of these bigger, almost cities inside of buildings. <laughs> Yeah, the scale of things is certainly uh, has certainly changed, or is certainly going to differ. As you said, you know, you're you're dealing with a couple hundred students rather than several hundred to a thousand to two thousand students. Um, Precisely. Uh, whereas I have a bit of I have most of my high school experience was in high schools of twelve hundred plus students. Um, so typically, quite large populations. Each each grade class had two to three hundred people in it typically, um, sometimes more. Uh, so you, your graduating classes were, were very large. They were fairly substantial. And so I do have the perspective of both that and a much smaller high school as well. And then I also have, I was able to ask some of the people that I work with, a couple of the high school students. Uh, I work in a kitchen and we have a couple of dishwashers that come in and a couple of starting cooks who are coming in to learn through the kitchen environment. And they happen to be sharing their perspective about how high school is. So I've got a bit of a fresh perspective uh, on the Canadian side of things in that regard. So I'll be happy to jump into that as well. But I do appreciate that you you setting the framework for um, setting a the, precedence the youth, for the conversation, kind of. Well, and just in regards to having certain like the displacement of tools. Uh, based on the educational proportion, based on, on the proportion of the education system that you've interacted with, I guess is the correct way to, well, to put that. The, the reason I, I mentioned well, it too is, is there's so many, uh, well, obviously there's countries outside of ours that have various educational system changes and, and differences that we may not even be familiar with. Um, I know that there's a few in Europe that have implemented things that they've found tremendously successful that we don't do over here in North America. You can have a school in like Africa where it's a grade school uh, or not necessarily a grade school, but like a one, one room environment, small, uh, local. And those students can learn mathematics and, and, do tons of things through just that small space and that's powerful so if we look at that and maybe they don't have access to the internet all the time and they just have a local uh, environment that would be i think the most beneficial the or not the most beneficial but the most uh beneficial thing to highlight about this example is you can have a group of people, if they're willing to learn, do a lot of things. But if they're not willing to learn, the capabilities go down. They're, they're not willing to interact. They're not willing to engage their minds towards the situation. And we come to this perspective as people who wanted to improve. There's a lot of people out there that didn't necessarily care about the academic part of it or pushing themselves out uh, for a challenge. Some people just really want to get through high school because it's something that they're required to do. And so with our perspective, just so the viewers understand, this is a general highlight of what I'm going to be bringing from my end of the American side. And I'll start now and get deeper into that. So. Genuinely, the biggest problem with the American education system right now seems to be communication. There's a lot of social media, obviously, penetrating these educational systems and environments where people are always subject to distractions, to influence and trends. And I think it affects the way that people like to present themselves when it comes to learning because people want to seem like they're adaptable, that they're able to handle the situation. They're not weak, I guess. 
uh, one way you could frame it is they're capable. And no one wants to feel like they're incapable. I, I don't think, uh, unless you know that that's something you're not interested in or you've, you've outright uh, ruled as, as something different, like having having a chance, an opportunity to engage with a platform or, or people or a project is positive. I feel like that's a good connection and bridge to make and form. Now, if you come to the education system in 2023, I have a few points that I wanted to highlight. The Pearson School Report of 2023, and we're going to have all the research uh, linked at the end of this show on our website and through the podcast. So if you have any references you'd like to make, feel free to check out the links. But in this article on page six here, the challenges and solution part, they say mental health, attendance, and support for students will send or with send are expected to be the biggest barriers to student learning over the next six months. And they think that the school-wide challenges for teachers um, to have cited by teachers are creating staff well-being and workload committees, getting creative with recruitment and ways to generate income for schools, and increasing training in line with growing challenges. I see a lot of potential similarities between our police force and the teacher staff problem. There's just so much staffing issues as is that keeping staff trained properly while they're already stretched thin is is just, it's stressful. It creates a stressful environment. I think if we implemented the system in a better way that was more efficient, or more approachable to accepting new hires where in and this is speaking with background checks of course because we all understand why that's implemented why things are are set up to be that way that there's precautions people have to take these are kids and we want to make sure and highlight that that's a, a very important factor i i think that's a very important factor in this to consider and and the options that are weighed. But with this being the case, we had to come and understand that you don't get people together in an environment where the teaching staff doesn't want to learn unless you want to set them up for failure because the teaching staff has to learn with the students and understand who they are to effectively teach them. And if they don't have that connection from that teacher, they're kind of losing the, the point of connecting themselves with the education. I think seeing a steward of the education system is important. And that this article in 2023 really highlights that I think after COVID and the, the realistically the the remote classroom came into play. People have seen both the pros and the cons of remote education and bringing people together for a purpose when the purpose seems meaningful. It's not just sending them to do random busy work. It's actually asking them to engage because the engagement portion is is where they're going to learn the most, where they're going to actually effectively see that learning. And Cactus, yeah, would you like to respond? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so certainly, I feel as though you're you're right that we need to implement a more efficient system. I uh, just want to add that with the way things have been changing in the current society, especially with tools like AI development and the different uh, communication tools, as you were talking about, we have a very, very fast curve of development 
And it almost feels like teachers are constantly stuck behind that curve, that and they're always understaffed. So it's very tough to feel as though they don't have an insurmountable workload to, to overcome because there are so few teachers and so many new students. Uh, as you mentioned, you have a pretty severe staffing issue. And I imagine it's fairly similar to what we have here in Canada. Uh, from my understanding, a lot of places do have a an educational staffing issue. You mentioned Europe. A lot of European countries have very well-staffed education systems because their education systems have been well-rounded and built over hundreds of years. They understand the value of promoting teacher health and teacher well-being because, just as you mentioned, those are kids and you'd want role models in front of your children. Those are the people where they go to spend six to eight hours a day in front of. I would want to interact with role models. In my professional career, that's what I aspire to have around me. I want role models in my life. So as a child, I, or and as a parent of a child, I would very much want a an individual that my child can look up to and can aspire to be like even if they don't want to be a teacher that they can take that learning practice that educational value into whatever field they choose to go into yeah i think that's an important point to highlight that people connect well when the staff is at their best when the staff feels healthy and if they're not balanced and they don't feel like they're able to engage properly, that adds stress. You know, they don't feel like they're doing quality work, maybe. Um, I it's, it's hard to speak from that perspective because I don't teach. But when I've had the, the chance to help people or engage with people on projects or troubleshooting, it always seems to be best when your patient when you're balanced yourself, when you approach the situation with a level mind, which sounds, uh, it sounds obvious, but a lot of people don't highlight those things when they go into situations that take engagement. I think the biggest draw for that with the teaching staff problem is we need to maybe implement AI for management um something something for the directory to to implement less paperwork i think would be the best way and making that just a little more streamlined for teaching staff on the requirements and then allow the staff to actually engage with their own content as uh, as a more personalized medium interesting okay so you would like to um how do I, if i'm going to phrase this properly you would like to see the administrative side of things be dealt with more by an AI model where, you know, learning tools or booklets and or testing that needs to be distributed is much more streamlined directly into Google Docs or directly into children's hands from that AI modeling. Yes. So, so it'd be like an, an educational AI assistant that would allow teachers, it would act almost as a teacher's assistant, but for the more digitized uh, processing parts of it, that would, as you said, be a barrier of entry for current teachers who may not be tech savvy, but who have a vast educational background and capability in teaching. Yes. Yes, precisely. Okay. And I, I think the biggest thing with that would be it's unbiased in the sense you could you could formulate the the AI and test the AI to a level where teachers and parents could access the resources that the AI is drawing from and study that to understand where their students are getting recommendations from or how the, an, the system is recommending the staff to best handle uh, a situation with a student. Like this has worked well in this school and you could have it connect with other school systems 
and then that's a the, great point it would be able to pull statistics from other areas and districts and be able to correlate why those statistics are relevant early ai would only be able to pull uh rudimentary numbers i'm going to speak generally here i am not an ai expert just to put that out there um most of us aren't let's be honest <laughs> even new. the ai experts are not ai experts so that's that's a fun time that being said i'm not an ai expert but generally speaking ai is not going to be capable right now to make an unbiased decision on that a lot of the ways ai models are being taught is biased and that's because it's being taught by people that's a difficult conversation for a difficult time. We'll maybe, maybe we'll have a, an ethical podcast discussion about that down the line. But for today, let's tie it back into education. So the, the AI tooling we have right now, I don't believe would be capable of just stripping data from, say, an upper scale uh, neighborhood that has a lot of private schools or Catholic schools and just taking their data of statistics and saying, oh, we implemented this system in this already successful school and they were 1% better, but they could take that as they're now 91% successful and just strip that one piece of data, that very targeted piece of data. So later as AI develops, I genuinely believe that they will have the tools to distribute that information to the parents and I do believe that's something we should be looking into developing because, as you said, bringing those tools into the homestead and putting those tools in the access of the parents is massive. So your parents have insight as to what their children are interacting with, and they can directly interact with those materials as well, which gives the parents a more hands-on uh, experience with their child's learning. And I feel like a lot of parents would feel very much appreciative of having that. Uh, I don't have children, but I know my my friends and, and coworkers that have children, they speak very highly of, of good education for them. So when you think about them receiving those tools that would allow them to be more involved with how their child is being educated, I think it's pretty safe to say that most people would appreciate having those tools in their hands. Absolutely. There's a big uh, effect that that would have, I think, on the parent-teacher relationship right there. And they would understand a little bit more with how the teaching staff reacts to certain situations. They could also implement their or submit their own recommendations and say something that they really want to see implemented in their students curriculum maybe they think climate change is important uh something that this uh article highlights is a section where two answers by teachers were highlighted and they really wanted to see quality assured age appropriate resources and making climate education a legal requirement. Those were two of the top concerns from teachers, uh, I believe, at least through the public education. I, I'm not sure if this article was just public, um, but most most likely mainly public uh, educators. And that was something they felt they needed implemented and I, I find that interesting because this would help implement that this would help people have a more personalized experience with may, maybe without shoving it down their throats yeah actually i think that's a really good point um i think i was just reading through that article there that you were talking about uh trying to find this be what you were talking about see if it was just public domain um I didn't see if they were including the private sector or anything like that, but it, it does, as you're saying, it's, it's educators that are saying that these, this is tools that they need to have. This is uh, a part of the curriculum that they need to be teaching. And if you have a, a series of educators that are all very passionate about, you know, their children learning those concepts, then clearly it's something that 
the education system needs to get behind the I feel as though the teachers don't have enough speaking power in their position to actually act on behalf of children sometimes, uh, especially in the current day and age. I feel it's almost if education is a lot of lobbying, uh, especially with the financial systems that are, are based around education. It seems every day, especially in Canada here, that financials um, just don't value education the same way they used to. And, you know, sometimes where the government is funding education and it seems like things are well, but then we cut spending on education drastically for five to seven years. And it's, it's so negatively impactful when you're already understaffed for teachers, you're already overpopulated for students and you don't have anywhere to put them because you're not budgeting anything for education. So it's hard to stimulate economic growth in a region if you're also not catering to uh, educational development in children. But <clears throat> I did want to say um, I like that teachers are advocating for climate science to be taught regularly to children because you should be understanding how our impact as, a, as human beings affects the world around us because one person isn't a big deal throwing an apple on the ground but you know, it sounds silly but because apples are natural they decompose they still take several years to fully decompose and to actually do anything useful in that cycle so it's, there's proper ways to go about doing those things to have that decomposition accelerated rather than just dropping a core on the ground because if one person does it, it's not a big deal if eight billion people do it it's a pretty big deal so we, we need to understand our impact as humans. I think that that's a really good thing that teachers are advocating in present day for children to understand climate science. However, I did want to jump back to the staffing issue. Do you feel like in present day that the staffing issue is worse? And obviously this one's going to be a little bit difficult to have a, a correlating opinion on because you have no current day experience. But just based off statistics and what you've looked into, do you feel as though the staffing issue now is more impactful than when you were in high school? Do you feel that you felt that the understaffing issue was was very drastic when you were in high school? I felt like there was a lack of certain fields um, being supported. Like music was always a controversial discussion. A lot of people wanted music and a music program to thrive, but ideally making that happen costs money. Uh, buying music isn't cheap. A lot of people don't consider that uh, is actually one of the reasons that these groups can't uh, continue to fund the music program is they can't afford the music. They can't afford the travel costs and they can't afford to maintain the music instruments because getting some of those musical instruments tuned or re refurbished is not cheap. And when you're talking about high school students, they're gonna drop things, they're gonna break things. It's inevitable in the, the music room. Uh, it, auto shop, metal shop, wood shop, those are all things that we have in America. I don't think all schools can afford uh, I mean, I know all schools can't afford to have those programs, unfortunately. Uh, that's something it would be great if that would be different. But when you're talking about uh, rural communities, you know, places where I'm from, where the money's just not always there. And we were, I'd say, a more well off uh, rural community because it's retirement based and there's different things that, um, like ranchers and, and old, old cattle. Uh, farms or cattle ranches that have helped fund some of the projects uh, in Plumas County, but it isn't enough still with all that going on uh, to even provide it for all the schools in that local area. So a lot of people have to travel or leave the region to gain that experience or go outside of school and, and you know, work through a job environment to gain those skills. That's something that I think is positive in the aspect that it can be a motivator to 
push yourself to engage outside of a school environment. But is it ideal? No, because it doesn't expose students to a proper hands-on environment where they would be able to engage with the curriculum at its full extent. It's like a doctor, if, if you had a surgeon and he said, oh, well, we couldn't afford to get the anatomy portion done of the education and I've actually never done it on a human body, but um, <laughs> I have really, I have confidence that it's gonna go well. <laughs> Would you still proceed? I, I, you know, no, I don't think logically anyone would would feel like that's ideal. <laughs> Oh, that's that's actually an excellent point. <laughs> that's uh, that's quite funny. Um, no, you're 100 percent right. Absolutely, you you wouldn't trust a surgeon who'd. It's like, well, I I read about anatomy one time, and I, I think I understood what the teacher was talking. Like 85 percent of what the teacher was talking about. So we're gonna go in and we're gonna remove all oh, the gall the gallbladder. We're gonna remove the gallbladder. It's, it's not a risky procedure. Okay, okay. It's, it's like it's like fifty percent risky. He might survive. He might. It's not that bad. Um, yeah, I, I got it off a of web <laughs> web web DM. You know. Web. <laughs> yeah. So so Chat Chat GPT is gonna walk me through this surgery. We're good, <laughs> right? You you would trust that? Like, no, exactly. You you're not gonna trust that to save your child's life. You're not gonna trust that to save your life. So. Why would you trust it to be an educational system? Like you can't have that level of uncertainty. You can't have that level of discrepancy there. So I completely understand that, <laughs> but you can't you can't trust that level of inaccuracy. And we shouldn't be just settling for well, that's good enough in our education systems today. So I I, I appreciate that little point of humor there, but that was a, a good tie-in. I like that. <laughs> Well, I appreciate it. And, and you know, it, it honestly branches well to the next point, because I, I think the, the way I view it is, is it really a big expense if those industries are suffering from a lack of workers, a lack of engagement with their workers? If we need more carpenters, we need more plumbers, shouldn't we have a, a course room, a workshop room where people are able to engage with PVC and and uh, carpentry tools that maybe would help them understand the process. Now, I understand the age has a lot to do with that factor, the liability. And at the same time, if you're a student, being able to at least witness and see those tools, if you sign a waiver and your parents sign a waiver, what's the problem? I mean, what's what's the problem? If there's proper PPE that they use in the industry, we yeah, we PPE kids up. You know, if that's the problem, then we make sure the the engagement's going to be safe. But I I don't see a problem with that. There needs to be a level of trust with kids uh, as well as educators. It's a relationship at the end of the day, and if you don't have a healthy relationship, you're not going to get find healthy engagement. Yeah, I, I actually I think you're 100 percent right about that, and I've I've advocated for that solution quite a bit, and I agree. The we need to get tools in front of kids that would motivate them to interact with these jobs, because we need to show them that they can develop their interests. And as you said, give them PPE. Teach. It's an education system. It's the education system's job to teach these kids how to interact with tools responsibly, how to be safe around their peers and coworkers because you're preparing them for a workforce. You're preparing them for learning throughout the rest of their life. Don't you want to give them tools that might be challenging to them and might motivate them to go on to cultivate an interest for the rest of their life that they could potentially turn into a career. I, for me, it's so strange that we work in, we, in a capitalistic way, but we're still trying to just push kids into a nine to five office job, knowing full well, that's not the future. And the education system needs to reformat 
in a way more catered to infrastructure development and humanitarian efforts and things that will actually benefit us as a society rather than this nonsense where, oh, it's not safe for a a 15-year-old kid to have a handsaw. The first time I used a handsaw, I think I was eight years old. You don't, like, you don't need to be 15 to use a handsaw if you're in an educational institution, in my opinion. You should be able to interact with tools to be motivated. But it doesn't feel like our current education system wants to motivate people and create passion from career or career from passion. No, exactly. (laughs) I think the, the thing with that, that you say uh, with being 15 and, and having those uh, interactions with a handsaw, a hand tool. Yeah, it's very true. I I mean, it, there's always dangers. There's always a, a lack of safety at any age that could be there. That's that's why we're surviving as people. You know, we're not necessarily um, always thriving. I mean, you could say it that way, but I I would I would just say as as a living creature, the sense is to survive, and you can't necessarily disengage from that there's similarities with education process there's gonna be natural learning involved there's things that you pick up through school that isn't necessarily part of the curriculum i mean your peers are going to teach you things maybe about social media or um, hollywood that's a popular one that's discussed in a school environment and celebrities celebrities have a lot of influence on kids that's something that's been talked about for a long time and i i don't think that's ever going to go away that's that's just how role models work people engage with different things and they choose to like and and <clears throat> appreciate values for uh, different reasons and it means a lot to students when they are able to choose and i think that's important give give the students a little bit more of a voice in their process i think you'd see more results certainly rather than trying to force them through the hoops that you think is educational and then you know how many times do you talk to someone today and you talk to them and oh i don't remember 90 percent of what i learned in high school i don't remember anything that i learned in high school Oh, I wish they'd taught me about taxes. I wish they'd taught me about this. They're not learning life skills. They learned how to socialize. And a lot of the time, you learn your own learning style. You figure out what does and doesn't work for you. But sometimes people need that extra help. And that's why this, well, it works for 60% of people. Uh, is like 60% of people is a really bad average. I, I'm... I'm no mathematician here, but if we did 60% of 8 billion really quick, 50% is 4 billion. 60%, what, 5.4, 5. somewhere around there? Right. Yeah, no, it's it's not good. Like, so you're, you're missing out on 3.75 billion people? So that's somewhere, it's over 3.5 billion people, let's be generous. I It's... That's a scary number. That's a scary number of people to just be left behind. We need a better education system. And obviously, that's the North American education system. But there are a lot of countries, as you mentioned, in Africa, where the education system in those countries is far less developed. And I believe that we have a duty as people to bring more education to everyone. I believe that the internet should be accessible to everyone because that would provide people with the opportunity to have better access to information. I believe that there should be more teachers available in each area and that I do believe that we should have AI teaching tools. I just don't ever believe that we should end up with AI teachers. 
because AI teaching models can, as I said, be biased and can be programmed to be biased. So I don't think it's appropriate for us to move to an actual AI teaching model, but an AI assistant to help the teacher lighten their workload and the mental load certainly would help, especially if we can create digitized testing and try and prevent cheating in that sense. Um, maybe cell phones get get deposited at the beginning of a test day and then you give out cell phones again back when that test is done, something like that. I don't know. I, I, I'm not a digital security expert. Don't pretend that I am. But something, some sort of system needs to be developed in these areas to help allow uh, you know a digitized test to be processed and graded by an AI teacher that would allow a lot of the marking and the grading to be just alleviated from the teacher so they could focus on curriculum and course load, how to develop kids, kids who need a little bit more help. But right now the system is just, I think, lacking in direction. And so its potential is limited. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. It's, it's not going to be ideal to have an AI teaching model in uh, recent like research. I wouldn't say that it's effective. Like you're saying, it's biased. It's based off of a biased model because it's based off of our information. So inherently uh, there is bias. Um, now an assistant would be great again for like just scheduling basic curriculum balance, making sure that your class is engaging with the standard um, requirements. It's fulfilling certain standards. Or even if you, you wanted to make something just for yourself, like something on your own standard, you could make something quality based off of what other people have, have uh, published or submitted. I think that's important if teachers were able to engage more with other teachers that is the strength of the the model and this is something that i wanted to implement before through like a job shadow program but i don't think through the liability of the the system that there would be much of an issue it's just having the funding and finding the funding for projects like these and, and gaining awareness uh, is where we're going to see results. Some Someone who has the potential to influence a system like this and, you know, if, if they're able to hear the message like this or see the points and they come across, uh, they strike them. There, there might be something that can change but for people like us who are not directly involved with the education system now it's it's hard to necessarily gauge how the process is going to happen i i've had experience in the past with it but again we're we're basing off of what we read in the present not our present engagement yeah that's a fair point and then one thing I would like to ask is, uh, do you think that in present day, uh, you mentioned Hollywood earlier, and then just now um, I was thinking about political influence. Do you think because of how much more access to information kids have nowadays in school and even teachers have nowadays in school, that that has directly affected the school curriculum or directly affected how the students interact with the educational system? Just because they have so much more access to information about how political decisions impact them as students or how you know they have rights as people and how teachers can treat them in the classroom essentially and now essentially what they are capable of setting boundaries of as human beings. I think uh, students <clears throat> a lot of times like to think they know their rights <laughs> and they, they use that as an excuse in the classroom to do something, you know, smart. <laughs> it might be true to that. And, you know, it, like phones. Like in, in this example, I'm going to use phones. You say, you know, for testing, 
uh, pull the phones. There's so many students I've heard in the past, you know, since I've graduated that are like, oh, if someone touched my phone, I'll be so upset. And then there's some that are like, well, I get it. You know, we're there for, for education, like, eh, whatever. Well, it, it's it got really a passcode on it, right? Like, what are they going to do? Hack your phone while you're taking the test? Right. And that's the biggest thing is understanding why you're there. The purpose that school fulfills for you is important as as much as how the student fulfills their purpose in the classroom. Being a distraction, you're only hindering other people's education. It's a reason why schools crack down on it so hard. And, you know, if, if you're a student out there that's struggling right now, like, I get it. I was not the, the A-grade student uh, on every situation. I slacked like anyone else. I did uh, certain things where, you know, maybe I didn't get my homework in on time every time. And I made decisions to, to enjoy life or to work on on submitting time for full-time work or, or sorry, part-time work at that time. And it it's important to just remember that you really do take out as much as you put in. And the time that I did put in taught me how to pull it out. It gave me enough to pull out and push towards something that I felt I could do effectively. And I took it, I took the initiative and engaged with the workforce. Not everyone wants to take the initiative, but taking the initiative and getting the step ahead, in my opinion, is, is something I'd recommend to anyone that's going through this because you're going to find challenges. You're going to find moments where you don't understand what's going on. And that's healthy because when you get out of high school, there's a lot that you're going to understand. You're not going to understand and it's going to be confusing. But if you motivate yourself to engage with the environment around you and you know, the steps to learn healthy, maybe you can take those steps and engage with a new subject that you're not necessarily used to through the high school environment. You don't have time. Maybe they just don't have time to put it in the curriculum. The, the course wasn't suggested for that semester and you're about to graduate. Boom, you have some extra time you want to dedicate towards your passions or something you could potentially find passion through. That's great. I think out, outside environment, is something we need to network and engage better with through our education systems and maybe having more community school outreach nights where community members can come in and and listen in on educators speaking about what's going on and what they're trying to do uh, with recent town engagements to help promote growth for different industries like if you're in a farming town you would probably hope that your local school would bring you more farmers down the road yeah yeah i, I absolutely i would hope that uh you would be educated by what makes your town a part of the ecosystem because I think we're very focused on what makes our self operate rather than the system operate. And I think the education system needs to focus a little bit more on how we're a part of the world and not just how we're a part of an area. And I think that, you know, as you said, you, you should bring, if we're going to keep going with a capitalist society, you should make commerce make sense where you're exposing children to the things that, they will have to interact with as jobs in their area. So if you're not planning on moving outside of your area, then you can choose to interact directly with those tools. You can choose to, to interact with that type of education that rather than it being, you know, a generic education that doesn't necessarily benefit you in any way, you can have a much more focused education. And on that topic, I also want to ask, do you think that 
there's a way that we could condense the school system so it didn't, doesn't take so long? Do you think that part of the reason students get so fed up by the time they're in high school is the fact that they've been in the school system for almost 12 years at that point? Yeah, I think uh, that's a good point to bring up. There is a level of exhaustion people experience, and I think that's from the homework load a lot of the times. The lightening of the homework load seems to be something that has happened. I can't necessarily say this is everywhere, and this is strictly speaking off the public school perspective. I believe most places have determined that uh, homework when you're really growing up in in a high school environment is not necessarily helpful it's it's more harmful because it's it's affecting the home life more than than anything and i i think the home life has become the spotlight element that people respect there's a major problem too and i there was a statistic when i was engaging with the a Plumas Charter School that I, I can't recall exactly who told me this, uh, but it was somewhere around 60% of the families in 2018 were from, or the students came from split families, um, which is a massive amount. 60% of, you're talking a thousand people, uh, maybe at maybe six, 700 still, that's, uh, we're talking 400 students. That's, that's a huge amount. That's over half. The, that, the curriculum should be able to effectively adapt for situations like this, where people need more supports. They need to engage in a different manner that's more positive to, making them want something better, making them want to find a solution that helps them maintain balance and is going to help them independently maintain it. Because ultimately, if you're not learning how to be independent through school, you're missing the point. School's there to help you prepare for the future as an individual in society. It should be. Now, does it do it effectively on every front? No, quite frankly, it doesn't. And I think that's a universal thing. It's, there's no education system that's 100% perfect. And I think every educator will tell you it's impossible to do that. There's just no way yep. to do that. But, People are too different, in my opinion. I don't believe that there's any one way that would educate every single person. So I, I don't think, and I don't think there's enough time to individually cater an educational plan to every person, I feel as though you would definitely struggle to, if I was in the position of an educator, I can't imagine myself being able to construct a curriculum that would cater to every single one of the 31 students in my class. I don't see how or or even more so now uh, i think max capacity in a classroom is 35 to 33 or 35 students in canada it's something insane a lot of schools are at capacity especially here in bc uh british columbia there's a lot of developing communities that are seeing three to six percent population increases uh in year over year of new student uh, in admittances so you're seeing small schools that had 400 students and are really only capable of handling like six to 800 now swelling upwards to like a thousand. And so they're trying to pull in more portables they're trying to pull in more funding. And you only have so much funding in order to be able to acquire portables, to acquire space, to put teachers, to put students. So you end up with this compounding issue of you need more funding because uh, your district needs to be able to house these kids. Because if you can't house the kids, the parents are going to move on. If the parents move on, then your commerce struggles in the town. So I, I do believe that there is a cyclical process. Um, but to tie it back into today's discussion, do you feel as though by today's standards, the education system is better 
at handling these problems? Or do you feel as though because of the staffing issues and because of financial issues that we actually could potentially be worse? I think it's definitely fair to say that it will get worse if the system doesn't want to modernize. Now, you have to make these systems attractive to the newer audience that you're trying to appeal to. The younger generation sees things differently. They, a, a lot of people, I think, still value the trades, which is great. There is a branch of youth right now that I've interacted with that are like, yeah, it's, it's where the money's at. Of course, I would go into the trades. You'd be crazy to want to go into high, uh, college. That's a flipped perspective. You, you can't tell me that you haven't talked to someone in the 60s, from the 60s, 70s era. I mean, a, even 80s, you consider in, uh, college as a heavy subject. Uh, I mean, you, yeah. could, you could argue now. I mean, it, it's never gone away. College is here to stay. But it is it is this incentric value of what am I getting out of it? What am I really going to invest myself into and why am i going to do all this extra work if all i do is work yes very much so yeah you're right i was kind of why i was hoping we would have some of our other panel members with us here today so they could share some of the older perspective i i think you you're spot on the nail there with we We've flipped the agenda almost entirely. It's now we need more trade workers, not qualified office workers, not not qualified uh, college students. We need workers. And that's flipped entirely from when in the 60s we had tons of workforce because you have the leftover mentality from World War II, that production mentality. It, it, needs, it needs to produce, needs to produce, needs to produce. Go, 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 go. Because production is economy and economy is good. And while there's good economy, there's good housing prices. And while there's good housing prices, you can buy a house for $15,000. That's what they know. They know that that money spot where things were good because banks didn't really know how to handle situations when went sideways. Pardon my language there. Um, the... The system now does seem more capable of handling how to distribute people into different avenues of workload, educational, uh, societal, health care, things that don't necessarily require an education, things like cooking. You really don't need any formal education to cook in most places. You can go anywhere and cook. So if you have one of those avenues, then you don't have to worry, but... We need to teach kids how to find those avenues. I do feel as though current education systems are better at presenting the avenues. I just feel as though there's still more steps to happen in the future. Uh, nope, I lost it. If it comes back to me, I'm sure it'll yeah. be important. Yeah, that's okay. If, um, if I may, though, there's another point I want to branch into. Uh, Certainly, please. To um this statistic here there's three quarters of teachers are confident in their ability to support pupils with pastoral issues they face um to address school-wide challenges the teaching staff have also said that um, creating staff well-being and workload committees getting creative with their recruitment and increasing the training were all things that they wanted to consider. And I think the we've highlighted the training, but the income is an interesting discussion because there's a lot of ways that the students could help with that. But a lot of times faculty is not willing to accept that as a reality. They, they don't want to accept that it's, they have to ask for help. I think it's a pride issue for some schools. I'm not saying it's with every school, but the the last thing they want to do is make the students feel like, oh, they're going to have to shut down programs or discourage them. 
and make it feel like they have to uh, do it themselves. I guess they they want to be able. They're educators at the end of the day. I feel like most educators no, right, really yeah. do want to provide that support, but Absolutely. sometimes like, the, they don't have that choice. the The board is effectively it's holding their hands. Yep. Yeah, very much. And it's like, um, I don't know if you ever had this in your experience, but very much in my experience, I had teachers go out of their way to, out of their own pocket, they would purchase things that were like extras for the class, bonuses, rewards, extra resources even, because, you know, art teachers didn't have a specific paper or something to try and do a specific project that was a part of the curriculum. And, you know, you could see the pain in those teachers' eyes when they're sitting there trying to explain to a student, like, we don't have it in the budget to have this thing. And it's it because they want the resource. They see the child have that passion, but they also see the passion be extinguished just that little bit every time you have to be like, we don't have the budget for it. You, you can't be creative today because we don't have the budget for clay or, or, you know, pastel or whatever it may be. We don't have that in, available. No, it's terrible when that happens. I, I think it's something that most people have experienced where they have had something reduced, you know, one of their ideas reduced to the ground because they realize, oh, I'd have to do 14 years of education. Oh, I'd have to buy $200,000 worth of curriculum. Like, oh, you know, this this textbook is going to cost me 5,000 to push in and and actually be on the the official level of of study that I need to be. The market and, and we're kind of, you know, this is kind of pushing into the college, but that's that's the important thing with this is the college discussion should be in the high school. The, the college discussion shouldn't just happen senior year. It should happen freshman year. I really do believe that it should be all four years of, of a process. Maybe start writing your grant paper in freshman year. Yeah, I know it's it's a lot to handle, but but if you're at least learn how to write a research paper freshman year 10th grade you're you're starting to break down and understand how the uh, paper is going to effectively improve your chance of a college career if you would like one and then you have that to consider in 10th grade in 11th grade you can just do whatever like that that'd be your year to to actually relax and, and enjoy high school for what it is. And then yep. senior year, okay, it's pedal to the metal. You understand, like, like this is your last year. You're trying to f- tie things, tie, tie up the knot. You're of age where you're about to, to move on. And, and that's when I think you should present your skills. And then that way, you know, everyone's prepared to this point. Uh, and you're not going to feel like everyone's going to crush you. It's more of like, oh, this is a level playing field. Like we've we've all done this, so what's there to be scared of? And that's why I didn't do it. I personally didn't do it because I I I also was confused on what I should do and what career I should go for. I had a lot to do with it, but I didn't want to go against the book sweats. I would call them, <laughs> you know. I I'm I love writing, but I'm not a reader and, and uh, you know, like some of these people who uh, were really formally educated on research papers and it, it intimidated me. It completely intimidated me. And I, I think that there was a point you wanted to, to make. I, I don't want to. No, it's, it's all good. Um, yeah. So you were, you're talking about how, the the school system itself was kind of intimidating for you and how where because you're you didn't feel as if you had a clear direction as to where to go in today's school system i do feel like kids have a lot more resources 
than what I had typically at my disposal, where it felt like I was very much forced into something in grade nine. It was, okay, take whatever you want. It doesn't really matter. Grade 10, take whatever you want, but you have two other courses that you can choose and they kind of matter. You should definitely choose some like extra hard courses because later down the line, that's going to bite you in the booty. This time in grade 11, it's like, okay, now everything matters. And if you didn't choose all the right courses up until this very moment, you're done for, and you're going to have to spend grade 12 using all four of your extra courses, taking all the courses that you should have taken that we didn't tell you that you would have needed to take in order to get into the career that you wanted to go into. Basically, so you're school, a pain. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, that's exactly it. It was just like, so I, I understand your perspective of grade nine, get them thinking about starting to write those, those tests because, or those, those reports, those uh, essays and things like that, because you need to have it thinking of, okay, grade nine, here's an example. Here's your structure. Here's three different ways that here's, it's always written in this format. Here are three different examples of how people would structure their thoughts. Grade 10, and, and you know, maybe even extend it three years. By the time grade 11 comes across, you're really focused. That's when it actually gets written. Grade 10, you do maybe some mock trials or you do, uh, you're focusing entirely on why you're structuring your thoughts that way, how you're trying to present your thoughts. Are you trying to win an argument? Are you trying to persuade someone? Are you trying to sell a point? Are you trying to just tell people information that is 100% factual, supported by established research? You can teach people how to do that in a very fixed period of time without making them feel like, oh my God, my whole life is structured around this final test and if I don't pass this final test, then I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. So it creates this sense of, of panic that is very unnecessary in kids. We shouldn't be we trying to panic, you know, 15, 16, 17 year old kids because, oh, what are you going to do for the rest of your life after this? Because we didn't teach you how to create a career out of something that you're passionate about. So just figure it out. Excuse me. It really is the wild west of uh, education out there when it comes to diversity. There's no telling what people are experiencing in urban and rural environments uh, all the time. There's going to be big differences, I think, with how older students and younger students see the situation as well. The freshmen might not care. And it may have a lot to do with the way education before was presented when they were younger. And that's another discussion for another day, but it does affect the way that students engage with the high school experience. If it's viewed as something that's just a meme or a, a part of society that people don't like that they're going to have to be forced into. Yeah, of course, they're not necessarily going to view it positively and, and want to put their best foot forward towards that. Maybe they'll put their best foot forward towards sports and something of that matter. Um, it, it's something I wanted to bring up is the, the workshopping that I used to do is they project called the XQ grant. It was a national project that took, I think it was around 15, it was either 1200 or 1500 schools and took different groups from those schools and their ideas that they presented for an educational rework. Our school, uh, IVA, Indian Valley Academy, had submitted a project and we had about, I want to say 20 plus members that were working on this project actively for a few months. The students that were working on it were 
polled like myself to uh, that were invited to engage on this project, basically from our uh, interaction with the classroom. With they saw that we were active students that we actually cared. We cared about our education, and they wanted to involve us in this process. Obviously, that they needed students for the, the project, but they also they knew that they didn't need everyone. They they needed the people that wanted to focus and wanted to work. It was a work project, and it was worth, I think, if you won, it was half a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, something. It was a substantial amount, basically. You could build a school from that. And that was our whole, whole thought process behind it was to help fund our new school at the time. Um, we ended up getting to the semifinals. It was, uh, I think, the top 12, top 15 out of all the schools. Um, I know for a fact it was below 30 at a point. So it, we were in like the, the top 5% of what happened with that project. And we got to see a lot of changes in our process as we went through. There were a lot of whiteboarding procedures that we did around what we would like to see in our education. We had a workshop with the whole school. And this is part of what I want to tie it into is there's a company called KidMob, Kid Integrated Design Firm. Um, they take workshops and they they make the workshop environment around the high school town and maybe they come to that school maybe they bring those high scores out to their facility in san francisco and then engage them with projects there but i had the opportunity to work with them a few times and they essentially host these where they bring specialists, people who are trying to specialize or study more in the, the higher academic scene. And they pull them into these workshop environments for the students to be able to engage and properly build product based off of what uh, problems are being presented. So if like one year they needed tables built, the community needed tables. So what did they do? They had the kids build uh, the templates, build the table and uh, present the table. They had the kids do the work. They did all the work. The only thing that they did for the kids was teach them how to do the work. They gave them the tools and those kids made it happen. And that was my point in saying what I did at the beginning with like an African school, maybe the one classroom environment where they don't have a CNC machine. <laughs> they don't have a welder. You know, not everyone has access to those, those kinds of, of implementations. It does not mean those kids are at fault and cannot process or learn or engineer. Yeah. They just may yeah, have, have zero right. opportunity. Yeah, that's exactly it. Like you're not, it's not that there there's incapability, it's inaccessibility. And exactly. that that inaccessibility really is what needs to change moving forward in the future for, for all of, of us, is that we need to put accessibility in the hands of the students because without it, they're suffering in terms of their development. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, that to touch back on this model, there's one thing that we did discover. We so so without you know going off, I don't want to just throw the model out in case they were going to use it, and I, I I just don't feel right doing that. But uh, essentially, it's it's kind of public knowledge at, at a point. We pulled from from public sources, and and it is my experience. So. At the end of the day, I, I learned my business concepts uh, a lot. A lot of the, the business concepts that I had early on were based on my experience through this project. It was a meaningful project. We, we did a lot of work 
when it came to the research portion. Earlier, I was saying that our school presented a workshop to the students that project had us literally measure the school um, based off of the blueprints. We mapped out our school and did the financial documentation for how much it would cost to refurbish those spaces. And we, yeah, we successfully did it as a whole school. Um, we successfully rebuilt our school financially in a financial demographic, just like any business proposal um, formally would be. We, we had to present it to a board and the board would either approve us or deny us. And if they approved us, uh, we got graded on our approval, basically. It was really cool. Like, I learned a lot from that because we only had three or five days to do it. And we had to work on a team. That was that was kind of the criteria. And someone like me, who I, I'm very much like, just give me a ruler and a pencil and, and I'll be back tomorrow. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'd much rather just find space and, and calibrate my thinking into understanding what's going on. But most times I, I don't like to ask for help. Uh, I try to figure it out, but I've also adapted my thinking since then because I've learned <laughs> that I don't want to continuously fall on my face because of ego. I want to humble myself and slow down and approach things with, with a more humble humble heart and, and understanding I don't. I don't need to understand it all. I need to understand that I don't understand it all and accept the knowledge in as understanding rather than forced procedure. Yeah, I think that's a, a very self-aware perspective. I think that's a very a good talking point. Um, so one thing I want to talk about today as well was the, the way that the educational grading system works here in British Columbia. This is a, a bit of a sore point for me. We, we removed the grading system, the traditional number grading system, and we replaced it with these four points uh, that I have up here at the top. Uh, the, the, man, this, it's, it bothers me, honestly. So we, you know, we don't have, there, there's no F anymore. You can't fail. Fail, I guess failure is just not an option. We're too big to fail. Failure is not an option? No way. Hey, you you can't I, actually fail in the, the I, British I Columbia. wish I was kidding, man. Failure That's is not an option. So you have four different categories. You have emerging, which is the worst term I've ever heard in my life to describe someone who is struggling with the academic content that you're, you're giving them. There is satisfactory. I, I, I'm probably wrong on that one. I think I, I didn't copy the right term there. Um, after that, it's proficient, which means that, like you're good enough. You're the average 70-ish percent. And then there's extending. And extending means you're going above and beyond the traditional curriculum and this i have an issue with i i feel as though the current curriculum needs to change but i'm not sure the grading system was exactly what needed to change I firmly believe kids have a better understanding of their own academic achievement. If you bring a report card home and you go, okay, I got an 86% in math. I understood 86% of the curriculum, of the in-class work that we did. And I just, I don't think that the way kids learn today is going to benefit in any way 
from essentially just misleading them about what part of a category you are. There, there's no there's no motivational factor in moving from whatever the second one below emerging or above emerging is up to proficient up to extending because you don't know where you you lie in terms of proficient you have no gauge of how proficient you are versus someone who's extending unless you have a direct comparison to someone who's extending and so now you're making it this social competition of oh well so and so's extent are you extending J- jimmy are you extending oh you're emerging. That sounds really good. Oh, that's the worst? Okay. Oh, all right. Well, I'm not going to ask Jimmy how, how to handle my grades. You're, you're left with this level of confusion of, I don't know where I reside. I much preferred getting a number grade. I, I test very well. I just don't like to do in-class work. I, I really didn't like school for that. I didn't feel it was educating me in a way that was beneficial to me. Felt it very much that it was a waste of my time. This is why I ended up dropping out, among other reasons. But the educational system was just not of value to me. It was easier to educate myself a lot of the time. So my motivation was if I'm proficient in... The English language, I want to know how proficient I am in the English language. I want to know, am I 76%? Am I 77%? And if I'm 77%, what's stopping me from getting to 80%? All right, now I'm at 80%. What's stopping me from getting to 85%? Because now I, I can refine my focus of learning down to a percentile, and it makes it much more manageable. If you say I understand 1% of a concept... That's a daunting number. If you understand, if you say I understand 67% of a concept, that's a much more manageable number. If you say 61% of a concept, that's a much more manageable number. It means I understand more than half of a concept. I'm already halfway there. I'm more than halfway there. Perfect. That's not that much more. It's, it's, it's not a logarithmic scale. You know, it's knowledge is built on a foundation. And I, I want to know how much of that percentage of their curriculum of what I should know, I know. And if it, if none of that matters, why are you using grades at all? It is my thing. Like, what what is the purpose of a grading system if you're saying, oh, well, that doesn't matter anyways? So it's yeah, you have ahead. to have you have to have the failure um, to engage properly. Yeah, because if a child's emerging for for twelve years in a row, and then you just push them into the workplace. What are they emerging into? Failure? Like, you're you're setting them up to not be set up for success. You're setting them up to not be ready to interact with a world that is not going to care about them. If you're forcing them to care about themselves, but they don't know how, because you as an educator just let them be stuck in that emerging bracket for an extended period of time. So you need to say, okay, you're you're not emerging. You're you're stuck. And you need to to have some extra help because you're not emerging. You need to be proficient. Yeah, I, I definitely see the the benefit of that. If you would just be honest with yourself and understand what you really need from the education that you're getting, then you may understand what you need to see improved. And it, a lot of it is covered up. You know, dyslexia is is something that a lot of people know now, but didn't know then and was considered, you know, you were just considered stupid pretty much because you couldn't keep up with the people that didn't have it and were affected the same way that that you were. And um, I don't have dyslexia, but I feel like I, I also struggled with focusing. That's something like... That's why I, I, what I'm really interested, I'll, I'll read and I'll read fast. But, but it, before in like sixth grade, I remember that being something that I struggled with, and I didn't really, um, 
I didn't really understand at the time why I struggled with it. I just knew that I was slower at reading out loud than other people. And it always frustrated me because I was really trying, but I would just trip up on my tongue and, and not explain things well. And, and people probably have noticed if they've, they've heard me discuss uh, in previous recordings, I'm not the most fluid speaker, but I have awareness about that. And I've worked for years at trying to engage in more healthy ways and not interject with more frustration or, you know, outbursts. And, and it's hard. It's very hard because speech and emotion are very intertwined and it's very connected. And trying to understand what you want to engage with, how you want to engage people uh, is important when it comes to networking. It's the most important because if you have respect for these people, you don't want to scare them. You don't want to intimidate them. You want to engage healthily. Yeah, as well said. Um, you also brought in a really good point about the mental health aspect of things in terms of when when I was in high school, my I'm not sure if, if nowadays it would change or be different, but my ADHD and, and my autism are definitely swept under the rug uh, because I was a high-performing student. I was a high performing student labeled as lazy with no initiative. But if you could get me focused on anything, I would be able to do it with exceptional levels of precision and detail and execution. The, the issue was always the continuous focus. Um, you know, I was willing to distract my willing to distract my classmates because I didn't realize at the time, but I was stimming. I was trying to stimulate my brain because I'm just sitting here like this is boring. And I didn't know how to do it without like getting up and being rambunctious because that would be perceived as uh, disrespectful. You know, you can't can't get up in the middle of class while the teacher's talking. That's a little bit more or more lenient now where, you know, OK, you get up and you need a stretch. That's totally understandable. We're human beings. We're not meant to sit for eight hours. So we understand if you get up and stretch, we understand if you, know, you don't need extra time on the test. Or I do like, you know, I need, I need 90 minutes of test time, but I might need like 10 minutes of break time in between that test where I can just stand, go and get a drink, do a little stretch routine, do a jumping jack out in the hallway if I need to, you know, just something to stimulate my brain. It's not sitting there staring at a piece of paper like, what is the square root of 68.67? without a calculator that's a great question you're gonna it be just, asked that can't. on every interview that's that's every uh, exactly question. that's actually that's i've realized that's how all of my current bosses have opened up conversation it's usually um hello uh welcome to the corporation that you're going to be working for here in the kitchen we really value people who are strong mathematicians so can you please just divide 68 point some decimal because we just want to make sure that you can you can do math. Yeah, we want to make sure you can slice correct proportions mathematically. <laughs> yeah, with a with a compass, we want to make sure with without without a compass, but accurate to to a compass's degree. Yeah, yeah. it really mm -hmm. it really all depends. You know, it truly all depends. Yeah, honestly, it's uh, the. The mental health side of things are definitely a different aspect because, uh, as I was saying before, my my neurodivergences were definitely swept under the rug simply because it's you don't focus on the kid who's doing well. You don't wonder why he's disruptive in class. You don't wonder why she's disruptive in class. It's you don't question those things because they're they're performing above the standard. So as long as they're performing above the standard, well, it doesn't really matter that they're not doing the classwork. I got away with murder in my classes just because I was really intelligent and to the point where I would sleep in my class because you had to show up for a certain portion of classes in order to be recognized as a participant of the class to get the credit. So I had to show up for classes that I had no value from and I would sleep in the class. The teacher's like, 
like the teacher would call on me, I'd answer the question to the point where they're like, 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 what do you mean? Like, you're literally asleep. And I'm like, yeah, I just, I know the answer. You have it written on the board. It's like, I understand what you're talking about. I went ahead and did all today's work. I'm done. Like, it's not written on a piece of paper. It's just, I'm done. So when a oh, teacher yeah. would, uh, would interact with me, they're like, like, what do you do with that? So it's like, as long as I wasn't bugging other, cl- other classmates, it was like, who cares? As soon as I'm bugging other classmates, though, it's like, well, you have to leave so-and-so alone. You got to move. And it's just like, no one realized that I'm not stimulated. So just giving me more work isn't the solution that I'm socially inept and no one's figured it out. They're like, wow, this socially awkward kid is quiet and reserved, except for when he's bored because we're not stimulating him. And now he's bothering everyone else and we can't possibly figure out what to do. It's like, oh yeah. And now, yeah. nowadays, I feel as though, you know, kids are recognized a little bit more. They can, their teachers have a little bit more understanding of, oh, maybe there's some ADD, maybe there's some ADHD going on here where, the kid can't focus. He's gifted. He can't focus. So whatever he can focus on, he's great at. But you, you need to recognize that there's that lack of focus first. And that you point me at something that I can be passionate about and I'll go all, all, all pistons fired, ready to go. I'll do it until my hyper focus runs out. And then I'll leave a half finished project sitting at the wayside while I start an arts and craft project, but we won't go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> it's important to highlight that you, you don't have the projects without the demand, you know, if people aren't willing <clears throat> to actually put, put themselves in those situations, like then they would never know their potential. And, but like, for instance, I I can relate to what you're saying because one of my favorite things is, uh, used to be, you know, if you have the worksheet, give me that stuff, give me that early. Like, yeah, I'd love to just work through when they were talking, like multitasking was something I always, um, found success with because it, it didn't necessarily mean that I was slacking off i was just uh being more efficient i was being more successful because i was viewing it as personal success in the moment where i'm investing in myself by investing actively in the work well being in the environment of the work to me that just makes sense to correlate the two but for some people they get offended by that and i'm just not that way like yeah if you can multitask do it if, as long as it's not going to hinder other people or, or like hurt other people if it's like you know you're operating equipment and you're trying to text yeah probably don't want to do that uh, yeah more opportunity to work at your own pace while still working within it's like in a school system is a bit a little bit different than in a warehouse environment, as you're saying, you know, forklift operator, maybe don't text and drive it's when you're, I feel like that's pretty standard. If you're operating something that could potentially maim or kill someone, don't be distracted while you potentially maim or kill someone. Yes. I could, I could be wrong. Maybe that's not common sense. That's why forklift accidents happen, but I feel like they're pretty minimal in terms of the scope of human existence. And the scope of all forklifts that have ever existed. So I'm not sure what that statistic is. Maybe we can find that and plug that in later. Um, but <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is uh, that now, nowadays, I think that we've made a lot of strides towards making it so people are more aware of what students need. But I think we need to hear out students more as to what they need from the education system because you or i can say we know what's best for the education system teachers can say they know what's best for the education system truly the only people that know what's best for the education system are the ones directly involved in it so you know it's difficult to give a a kid in grade six a quiz about how he feels about the school system but 
maybe you know your grade nines, your grade twelves, your college students, your your entrant level college students all get a, a, a test at the end of the year. That's literally just a feedback test. How do you feel this school did? Like, like a job would do. And you'd be like, hey, can you just like fill out this this quick review of how we did? It's like, why would you not want that as a school? How did we do? Do you feel like as as a school that we failed you? Do you feel like that we that we provided you with enough tools for you to succeed? Do you feel like you were enriched for coming to this institution? Because I feel like that's truly the value of an educational institu institution is they can in provide enrichment in your life in some regard. You can gain a skill, a, a way to gain knowledge that will allow you to do well in life afterwards. Yeah, I definitely agree. There's a lot of balance when it comes to the relationship of, of again, that, that home school relationship. There's not a lot that students have to worry about when it comes to that. It's more so on the parents because they have the uh, living situation most times and they need to handle certain academic administrative processes for the student. So if they're not involved, the student's just going to struggle. So it really has a lot to do with how that dynamic's going. And on top of it, where you're wanting to direct the energy and the investment that you're getting out. And I, I think that's where education's really changed in America since I've left is there's more hostility. Since you left for America? No, uh, no, since I've left the high school system. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I'm in Canada. <laughs> oh, he's a Canadian. Uh, uh, yeah, you can't fail. Forever. You can't fail in Canada. So exactly. <laughs> failure doesn't exist. Yeah, I I mean it's the American only, dream only is dead. I'd rather just go to the no fail <laughs> place. Like Canadian dream, man. <laughs> Canadian dream. Uh <laughs> But uh, ultimately, yeah, come live up the Canadian dream. We got you here. <laughs> no ultimately, failure. The, the uh, difference that I have is the education is more centered around personal development and individual personality, I think, than it has been before. The implementation of social media yes it's made i think certain habits more reinforced certain negative ha uh, habits typically associated with negative connotation reinforced like attention span short attention span i think is an issue it's something i try i practice to alleviate that i do long form things to alleviate my short-term tendency because i'll do it too i'll sit there like anyone else i'll see a cooking short I'm like oh i know it's a short but man that, that looks good <laughs> and i click on it you know and then all will be like oh well how many other things have they cooked and then I, before i know it i'm like oh get off of this deep down i'll cut myself hole. off it's, yep yeah they, deep down i have a rabbit hole that you had no business being in anyways no, I, I only did it because I'm human and, and that thing on the screen made me think about a human reaction that would fulfill my need. And that's the thing. I'm not really fulfilling a need. I'm fulfilling a desire. We, if we live in this world of desire, we're going to expect outcomes. We're going to expect those things because people are producing those things. Maybe they're the same age as us and we're a little jealous. You know, oh, why do I have that? Maybe we don't think of it as jealousy, but uh, it's natural. It's a natural tendency for jealousy to appear when you're subjecting yourself around a reality that's maybe different than yours. Um, 
Now that could be a lot of things. It could be family. I, I know there's a lot of people that envy a healthy family situation. Uh, there's wealth again. Uh, wealth is obvious for obvious reasons. Money, money rules the society around us. So if you Very are able to navigate comfortably, of course you're going to be more comfortable. <laughs> This it's a whole level of, of the word comfort, in my opinion. It, it comes from a societal standard of this is safe enough for me to exist <laughs> in this in this place in this region. Uh, if you don't agree with society, can you really interact with it? Um, yes, but comfortably, eh, that's arguable. So. Uh, and when we're talking about emotions, it's all opinion. I don't, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not going to pretend like I know uh, direct answers here. And I've talked to, you know, uh, the Dalai Lama. Cameron Scully, about, PhD. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have. I have MD, BA. And dirt. Dirt <laughs> is healthy. You should play in it. And it's. Dirt will gonna, help you grow. Yeah, it's going to cut you and it's going to harm you and it's going to make you fail, but it's also going to grow. Yeah. If you can be like dirt, be a little dirty sometimes, but grow, you're good. You can have worms in you and worms are in dirt. <laughs> yeah, you know, those are side effects. <laughs> side uh, and effects and dirt. Yeah, you, you get a little, a little dirty. Everything has side effects. Yeah, that's, that's what... Uh, that's what the plants are for. You just, just eat them. I don't know. Okay, what there are, you go, guys. Cameron Scully, MD. Let's give him a round of applause. Yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, it, that's a whole other discussion. I don't need to go down that one. But yeah, we, um, don't need to, we don't need to talk about the dirtiness of dirt tonight. No, 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 no. Agriculture is a whole other can of worms to to discuss another time. But um, to circulate it back around un unless cactus wanted to make any more direct points on the canadian side of uh education um, Let me just check i have my a point notes to ba, 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 ba. i pretty much covered everything the only thing that i missed was school start times did get pushed an hour ahead uh this is yes. kind of different because i i i already had a, a later school start time like our our county i think had a later start time than some uh, it was like 8 15 and that was in 2005 2006 so that was a while ago um still not incredibly late in the morning that's still you're getting up at like seven and you know but now they have it at 8 40 it looks like in a lot of places yeah i was looking at that i think it's the same thing here is 8 40 in the morning and i was like I, I think there's some science behind kids not having to wake up early in the morning and productivity in the classroom, uh, as well as excitement for learning. So I I think there, I'm sure there is research. I don't have it in front of me cited particularly. Um, I, I know I've stumbled across it a few times where there's information about we're trying to help people adapt more to the current school system. Uh, I think it's the wrong way to go about it. I think we should be changing the school system to adapt more to today's work home life cycle as that has changed drastically since the school system was invented and hasn't really restructured in just over about 100 years. Again, it's, it's oriented for the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and we're well past that. We're in the technological revolution We've passed in the industrial revolution by. We understand industry. We use it every day. So I think that we need to develop the school system in a way, the educational system in general, in a way that is a little bit more flexible with today's schedules and routines, because it's not just the nine to five that we're used to uh, from the days of old, where that was the standard operating hours for pretty much every business known to mankind. Uh, except for the grocery store, which was open for a couple more hours, so you could get home after work and get to the grocery store. No, I totally agree. <laughs> it, it's changed in 
in some dynamics there and and I think that we need to accept that we do have a voice in these changes. If we know that the changes are going to come, we should apply our voice and apply reason to that conversation. Um, I think everyone's guilty of being upset at the educational system. I know I am. I've had moments of spite where I definitely uh, wanted to stick it to the system and I could care less. Uh, you know, let's do something outside of school. But ultimately, there's there's never going to be a better avenue than the public school system to directly affect education in a country. And I'm just speaking to what I understand education in modern society to be, be as. I'd say most civilizations that have modernized uh, want or desire a public schooling system because they understand the implementations, especially of the modern day, require higher education, even if that higher education is considered a high school. I think at this point, in day and age, High school can be considered a higher education. You could argue it always has been, but do people really oh, in so oh, social standard consider it so? Like, no, I'd say our academic threshold has lowered since mom and dad and grandma and grandpa have been to school, you know? No, I, I wouldn't wholeheartedly agree with that. The, the threshold has certainly lowered again, as we were talking. Uh, the desire for a degree has certainly gone down. Uh, less people, I think inflation has a big part to do with that as well. I mean, you don't want to go and educate yourself entirely when it's just going to cost you an arm and a leg, and then you're going to have to pay that back while fighting against inflation for the next 10 to 15 years. doesn't seem like a practical investment if you learned anything in school. So that being said, I feel a lot of people are trying to look for outside avenues outside of the what the potential public school system would offer them because our societal threshold is, oh, you need a college degree, you need this amount of experience and blah, blah, blah. But in reality, uh, I personally believe some variation of a high school diploma or like some variation of, a, of most of a high school education and work experience and just being out in the world with people is enough to get you a high school education, what you really need to understand how to live in the world. The, the public school system is focused on a lot of the wrong things. And I feel as though to step forward, we need to restructure in those areas. That's my personal belief on the system. Um, I have a couple more things at the end that I want to touch on. I actually have a really cool article about seven useful tools for educators that AI is going to help be helpful for it. I know that loop back earlier in the conversation, and then I'll pull that up on our shared screen here so we can both read through the article. Um, just because it, it's, I was glancing through it earlier and it's got some pretty interesting stuff in there that as it generates in the future, I feel as though we'll have a lot of potential. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what? Like I wanted to refine something I said, it was, the threshold um threshold is the right word to use but um uh, th to the degree i'm talking about is of content there's a content threshold where when it uh, or a medium threshold where your medium of learning the content has lowered because the accessibility has increased and because the accessibility is increased in communications, less efforts have to be put on the individual when it comes to the workplace structure. There, there's programs, there's computer programs for that. There's uh, formatting programs for that. There's writing programs for that. We don't need a typewriter. We don't need someone who need, knows how to repair the typewriter. You know, these things are dependable devices are, yeah. they're operatable so operations in general has improved in efficiency since uh the factory work of the model t you know like <laughs> we've come a long way since public education at least in america's been 
really structured the way it is now. Yeah, and the inception of the public education's current system. And that's that's an interesting thing to talk about, too, is that we're talking about all the, the nuanced changes of the of the education system. But when you actually talk about it, it's because there haven't really been any massive overhauls of the education system that I'm aware of in many, many years. There hasn't been like, yeah, we change out the textbooks because there's some information out there that some of it still says it's okay to beat your wife in some of those textbooks, I'm pretty sure. So it's it's a little, little dicey. And that's the, some of those so early that's the same way, uh, essentially in Canada, that it's the same way. The system is old, like factory work kind of age. Yeah, they tried to polish up the system and make it work with modern times. But in reality, they, they, they haven't changed the system. They're keeping the same rigid structure and they haven't made any significant advances on things that would actually change people's attitudes towards learning other than just making it easier to, you know, you have laptops in the classroom now. So information is technically more accessible, but you're not inspiring anyone to seek out information. You're not teaching anyone how to learn. You're just giving them a tool that gives them the website that gives them the resource that you were going to give them anyways. So it's like now, instead of giving you a piece of paper, they give you a $1,600 laptop and you open up Google Documents and you look at the paper. I don't get that. I, I don't like, they're, they're, I understand we're trying to minimize paper waste. There had to have been an easier way. Like yeah. encourage more class interaction so I don't need to have that sheet in front of me. Just the teacher needs the sheet. We all go through the answers as a class. That would encourage communal learning. Yeah. Throwing ideas out here. Just throwing ideas out. And again, not an educator. Just someone who went through the education system. Wild concept. Get people involved. You want to reduce paper imprint and that's what you're doing? Don't waste thousands of dollars on computers. Get whiteboards, get things that get kids up on up on their feet, interacting, writing on the board, having fun, making the education interactive. Because I know for me, I wanted to be able to interact with the learning. I didn't want to sit there and go, okay, the Pythagorean theorem is going to be used anytime. If you love triangles, Pythagoras is going to be your best friend. You, you and Pythagoras are all going to get along because... And he was right about those triangles. Ha, that was a triangle joke. Ha ha, right? Ha, don't be obtuse. Get your triangle jokes in. Oh, man. Yeah. He like, hit yeah, I, I, triangle I, joke. That's the, the, every math teacher I've ever had, man. It's not exciting. It, like English teachers and art teachers were the most exciting people ever. Because they're super passionate about literature. They're super passionate about Shakespeare. They're like, I love the Bard. The Bard is my man. I love Shakespeare. We're going to do Hamlet, and we're going to get into it. And my, my English teacher made us get into a garbage bin to reenact a scene uh, with a wicked witch from Macbeth. Well, I was the head <laughs> witch in a cauldron that got summoned by three other witches. And I'm just standing there in a recycling bin. There's a picture of it on my Facebook I'm standing there in a recycling bin reading from the book. <laughs> We're all reciting Macbeth. Oh, yeah. I, she encouraged us to use accents and everything. She's passionate. She encouraged learning in a way that made it so that you wanted to be involved. And it's like, we need more of that. Not, oh, well, get on your laptop, get on your tablet, kids, and then go and do the digital work. Well, no, like that's... <sighs> You're just encouraging them to to reinforce the bad habits of, oh, I can just get on technology and, and you know, th this has all my answers in it. I don't need anything else because I, wh why do I even need school? I got this. You're just going to tell me to get on a different version of this to go and get the answers to your, your question. I, Pardon my language. You're, you're just going to get on this just to give a different version of this, just to give your answer or get your answer to the question. So it doesn't make any sense. No, I, I totally get that. It, it's 
and you know what's funny is the education it it was always the part that i missed the most when it was passionate teachers because that taught me how to be passionate about something like it inst- yeah inspired me to instill passion in what i did like my music teacher my english teacher my uh I mean, I had good teachers. I was fortunate to have really good teachers. Uh, the teaching staff of Plumas County is generally really skilled all around. There's not a lot of bad teachers to students. Um, there are some, of course. We had one teacher who ended up doing hard substance. She was out of the class for like three months. We're like, where's our main teacher? And they're like, oh, well, she's arrested. Like, yeah, not great. but. It, those things happen and it's bad apples and in, in a good bunch um and if you can take it with a grain of salt and understand that yeah maybe that teacher mistreated you or, or you disagreed on on something but that's what they know and, and maybe they're not trying to set you up for for failure they're just a little frustrated with how you approach their classroom or maybe you weren't weren't focused on the project at hand and, the way they viewed it was you were distracting the class, but really you're you're just naturally inclined to be a little bit more disruptive because your focus is dr- disrupting you. Your, your well, yeah, as focus. much as as much as they're passionate, they need to understand that they're dealing with children who haven't developed that passion, and. This is why I said we need role models in our classrooms earlier, because you need people that can be there to inspire passion and then understand that when there's not passion, that forcing kids to do things and making them do it your way and being unbelievably rigid of, it has to be this way because this is just the way it's done. The kid's not trying to do it your way at all. All right. Stop. Stop trying to put him in a chokehold with with the only way he can do it, but it's the only way that doesn't work for their brain for for anyone's brain in high school. Like I know for me that was the case a lot of ways. Teachers like it has to be this way. I'm like well, why does it have to be this way? Especially with math. My math teachers oh, used yeah. to get so mad at me. They're like I can't follow your math. They're like and I would just explain it to them. Like what do you mean? You know I I did this part and then I multiplied this. They're like you did that in the same step. Yeah. Like no one does that. You you need to do this step and then this step. I'm like, I like, well, because how, how do I know that you're condensing it? It's like you, you do the math. You you just do the math and you would notice that if you condense that equation two steps down, doing it your way, you'd get this number that I plugged in here and just follow the proper math and you're good. And the teacher was like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, so you're saying my way is wrong because I'm not following your step-by-step procedure. And a lot of the time, the teacher would tell me yes. And it's just like, I feel like nowadays we do have a little bit more freedom. The kids have a lot more freedom in expressing expressing their way rather than the teacher's way. And it doesn't just need to be, you have to do it this way because this is the way it's done. There's more, oh, okay, I understand you maybe need to do it a little bit differently because you don't have the understanding that a 30-something, 20-something-plus-year-old teacher would have. You're dealing with children who have, are developing minds, not developed minds. Yes. Yes, it's it's a big difference. Yeah, and, and it's something people don't consider. They, they don't consider how much... Um, passion affects the learning process it's something that you mentioned earlier with the english teacher uh, our english teacher ironically did the same thing she was a well i don't know if she your english teacher properly did theater but ours did like proper theater classes and would run like theater productions and plus doing I think three different classes of English and her schooling for English education at college. And then now she, I don't know now, but she was in China 
teaching kids English. No, um, she's doing overseas teaching. That's awesome. Yeah, she she's I I haven't talked to her in years, but she is probably one of the best teachers I ever had because and she was hard. And there was times where she got on me because of my opinion, and we disagreed. You know, we disagreed, yeah. but I respected yeah, it because she said it only because she cared. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of people understand is when you're, when you're having like passionate criticism, uh, it's easy to take it as someone's angry and they're insulting you. But a lot of the time it's you're, you're passionate about sharing the information and you, you wouldn't share it if you didn't care. And it's not a personal attack. It's just, you're very expressive when you're passionate. You want people to understand your point, your passion, that your love for this thing is what's fueling your your knowledge, your education behind it. That that's why you are so driven to continue to pursue this point to this this opinion that you have. Precisely. Yeah, it's I mean yeah, balance. English teachers taught me balance, a lot of them. Uh, one taught me to stand up for myself because I totally disagreed with her point. And she was wasting my time, it, how I felt. So I stepped out of her class. It was one of the only classes I've ever walked out of. I don't like doing that. But it, she called me something I wasn't unjustly and said it was English, said it was you know, but but her definition was wrong, and she wasn't willing ah. to to get off of that. To stance. Change her definition, and as an English she teacher, was how fixed. can I respect that? Yeah, but that's still yeah. a lesson I learned from her to a degree. I, maybe I those students learned genuine writing techniques, and she probably has a great writing form. But to me, the person personality, the connection, the passion there was was lacking. She didn't respect my passion for being in her class. She only wanted to tell us hers. And, and exactly. She only wanted to respect her own passion and her own viewpoint. And that's biased. I, I'm not here for a biased experience. I'm, I'm here for a open experience where they're willing to be wrong, you know, in, in understanding. Maybe they like, for instance, in, in my way of saying that, um, Let's say a teacher has everyone doing a biography. They tell you, um, or biography. It's been a while. A biography is just um, a research over a book. General research over a book. biopic. I was thinking bibliop. I know bibliography is. The, bibliography might uh, be the right word over the life um no bi biography because like an autobiography would be yeah, biographies general oh, yeah, I I have to, this is driving me nuts now. it's all good i already got it up here uh do, 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 do. what is in a biography a good biography presents the facts about a person's oh. life including what the subject did and how he or she made a difference in the world he she or they excuse me Update your uh, your freaking definition, JFK Library. No, I know what you mean. Or yeah, I I just a bit of a brain fluff. But um, so let's say <laughs> someone's writing a bibliography, and they choose um they choose someone political, and the teacher's like, hey, you know, I love that you chose this subject. Uh, but then the class shuns that person for presenting that project because it's political. And the teacher's like, oh, well, you need to stop that project now. This is, class is offended. That that would be where I would be upset as a, that student because yeah, suppression really of opinion. Supported, exactly. And that's how it felt to me. To me, it was like, okay, uh, at it, the the comment was uh towards men and i felt as a man i was entitled to an opinion and she didn't agree and it's it was unfortunately something that 
I decided I'd rather step away than create a scene and and like like this show. I'm not going to mention any names or anything. There's no public shame to be had. No, of course. Um, but it's it is definitely a learning lesson in in my educational experience that a lot of people have uh, had to do it in one way or another. People drop classes all the time in colleges, and for the high school students that don't understand, like C's get degrees. Okay, you're going to hear that one at least once in your life from someone in college and it's going to sound depressing and you're going to wonder why. And then you're going to understand uh, eventually that <laughs> C's get degrees and you need to pass that one test. And if you don't pass that one test, <laughs> you might you're not, not gonna get the degree. <laughs> so yeah. Um, making wise decisions before you get involved with, academics, uh, understanding who's teaching the class, uh, getting that personal connection is an important part of the educational experience. And I think if you're in high school, really looking to make better quality connections uh, in that regard, making sure you get quality rest, quality diet, um, at least, you know, it doesn't have to mean eat five-star restaurant every day, but Let's like nothing but Michelin less star. chips, you know, less less bread, less heavy gluteny, starchy stuff that's just gonna burn away in, in a few hours. Like you gotta eat those vegetables, you gotta eat those proteins, man. Gains. If you're doing sports, you gotta you gotta make the gains to recover Te your technically growth. carbohydrates are good for long term to burn. Carbohydrates, carbohydrates are good, but not not white bread and chips. That's my well, point. Well, yeah, because that's the, like, the yeah, bad excess sugars process. and and trans fats and and fatty acids and things like that. So yes, well, let, not, me, not so much fatty let acids, me specify but. is is like wheat bread and, and such like that. Don't stuff like that. Don't ignore the value and the potential value in those micronutrients and minerals. Then that's that's all I mean by what I'm saying. I'm obviously, not a dietitian, but I've been an athlete. And I, I understand an athletic diet from the inside as, as being through high school sports and recreational sports. It's important. I got an injury. I bloated it up because I ate too much French bread. <laughs> That's a fact. Okay. French it's bread, French bread. destroyed my life for a while. Uh, 20, 2023 do is the year of 2024. So we're going to be going in 2024 here. 2024 is going to be the year of, of high school kids just spending all their disposable income on five-star restaurant food and really just, just live it up, honestly. You're in high school. You don't have much to be happy about. So you may as well get some nice food. Yeah. Up, yeah. yeah at the Michelin star restaurants. Get the Gucci shirt. Why not? <laughs> Yeah, it's at the end of the day, it's it's all individual, right? It's, it's you're gonna have those people that think it's a joke and, and end up doing it for the the hype, and you can't really stop them. If you, it's like the people, people that man. prank classrooms and and put their teachers on TikToks. I always wonder when I see people on on videos, like, man, what what happened in in this classroom that this student's like, man, I'm just gonna like. Put my t-shirt teacher on day. blast. Yeah. <laughs> Another I, day, like potentially their career. Yeah. P potentially their entire career. Oh yeah. All, all because like the the kids might just be absolute degenerates that push the teacher, and, and that's actually a really good talking point for today's discussion and like how things have changed in terms of like teachers' mental stress. Uh, I think that's a good talking point is because teachers that don't ha have have. To, or teachers in our day didn't have to deal with the the pressures of like social media nearly as much as today's kids do where it's just oh i'm gonna go create a quick two minute video reel of my teacher with my phone and my purse that i told him he couldn't take from me because he'd be violating my rights and you know now i'm just gonna take a video of him and put him on tiktok and ruin his career because we literally are so like rambunctious and 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 hyper and inattentive that this teacher is at the point of having a mental breakdown and is now screaming at us and is not being unreasonable is literally just raising their voice in a lot of these cases and is oh. just like literally at the point of wits end like are you guys kidding me right now like i'm just trying to give you an education i'm just trying to provide some value in your life and you can't even give me enough time to to give you information 
And like, and like, I get it in a lot of the situations, as long as you're not like freaking out and throwing stuff at kids and you're not being overly aggressive, it's totally understandable to be pushed to the point of, of, of mental anguish by, by a group of kids who do not want to respect you because their parents didn't teach them that you have to respect educators and, and people that are in positions of authority and educators are an authoritative position. Yes. Like, these are people that are providing you with information. Yes, it might not be the most valuable information, but they're trying to, you know, provide you with learning structure. Oh, I, I remember someone. Uh, I mean, I'll. I was really hoping some of the other panel members would be able to attend, um, but due to that technical issue, unfortunately, we're, you know, we're a little short today. But one of their experiences from their high school, because we went to different uh, high school towns. Okay. even though we were from the same town so they technically have different experience and but i know their experience because i knew everyone in there and it's uh i guess i don't remember which teacher i won't say names of course but someone i guess uh ended up leaving teaching like they made this teacher quit because of oh, wow. how mean the class was to her they made her cry and uh, it was something like they all kind of like, I wouldn't say they all regret it, but they reflected on it <laughs> heavily later. And they're like, wow, we did that. Like, we should probably not do that again. <laughs> and uh, I could I could always tell from an outside perspective, it was an awkward subject. Like, um, it, it was definitely like something that didn't need to happen and got too personal and it was bullying like they basically bullied that teacher out of wanting to do her job that's terribly sad uh, another example was my music teacher in greenville he used to get all sorts of problems like that where people would just not respect what's going on like we're in a music class we're trying to actually take like a lot of us like me i was actually taking the music serious wanted to maybe potentially get funding to go to college through music and to, to me like these people were pissing me off too and and it's hard as a student who wants to learn to not want to fist fight the person who's goofing off and that's the dynamic too is yeah it, anger's an emotion we all have we all share and um to, to have your time wasted as well as the teachers is frustrating. Like when you're on the teacher's side, uh, like it's hard to justify the teacher showing you respect because it's like, well, I understand why there's um, rules the way they are because of people like this. And I mean, over that one discussion, it was, I'll, I remember this one blatantly. And it's one of the only discussions in high school I remember blatantly. It's hilarious. But, like, it, these people were arguing with the teacher over if it was a trombonist or a tromboner. And it's a trombonist. But the kids kept saying tromboner. And he got red in the face mad and he stormed out. We used to call him Storm and Norman. Uh, <laughs> the only teacher I'll tell you about. Because Storm and Norman's a legend. And if the world can know about Storm and Norman. Because he would just storm out of that class, take a deep breath, you know, come back in and be like, Whoosh, you know, let's no, like you settle down. Like it, it was like a him him Norman versus man. You know, every day. He just there. didn't collect himself and then come back and be like, nope, that's not how we're doing this like, today. I run this class. Down. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, we all, the people that really liked him, we just knew to stay out of his way. Like, he'd eventually figure it out. He got a thick skin and, and um, he took control, but not full control. You can never have full control. It, it really does come down to personalized respect. And a lot of people don't carry themselves in a, a way that is uh, conducive to that respect. Yeah, that's entirely fair. Um, 
I feel like we're getting a little bit off topic from today's discussion, but we are having some good conversations. So we'll, we'll definitely leave it in. Um, I will pull up this resource. I think that we can do this. And then screen sharing exists with two monitors. Yep, that's good. That's not the right screen, so we're just gonna find the right screen here. There we go. Hey, look at that. Just like that, we've got an article here. Go full screen on this. So this is a little bit on the positive note about the AI side of things for teachers. These are seven tools that educators will be able to be using in the future, in the near future, uh, or that are already in the hands of educators that they can start to use to help them, as Cameron was saying, facilitate some of that administrative work and some of the other things I didn't quite get all the way to the end of the article, so we'll find out as we go. Um, this is a big one, is why educators need to understand AI tools, especially when it comes to copyright infringement and theft of intellectual property. Um, so you, like plagiarism is what they're going to call it in schools. But when you're literally just stripping other people's works, putting your own name on it and saying, yep, I did this. Pretty much any AI language model right now is that's what you do. If you ask ChatGPT to write you a five paragraph essay on uh, the war of 1812 and its significant impact on cultural relevance at the time, then you you're going to get a pretty cut and paste very much from other internet sources article. Um, teachers could reverse search it and find bits and pieces of your essay. And if so, they're dismantling it and get caught. As AI gets better and better, teachers are probably going to get the upper hand in terms of detection methods. I, I can't see unless language models get incredibly good like i can't even think of a situation that would be the language model would beat a detection model that would say this is ai pulling from these sources i, I think it would almost be easier to reverse engineer that process but we're not there yet in the future so we'll find out as technology develops probably in the next five ten years but why educators need to understand AI tools, uh, what I personally believe before we even read this, is these tools are already in the hands of students. You need to know how to avoid plagiarism, how to avoid these students not putting in any effort. And the effort that you're trying to teach them is that learning structure, they're going to take away a lot of the merit from that learning structure by just going, oh, okay, chat GPT, what is the... Uh, what is Euclidean geometry and what is the definition of this and what is the definition of this? You, you get no value because you're just getting quick super source instant gratification information. There's no, I had to search for this information. I've acquired this information. It's just like, oh yeah, I've got this information. I can go and get it again later. It's on my phone. There's, there's that accessibility now. So... AI is, is definitely allowing students to be lazier with the current system uh, until the current system changes in a way that challenges students in different avenues. Standardized testing will fall prey to AI tools. Just yeah, I agree with that. that. If you have anything to add, by all means, go ahead right now before I jump into this. No, I, I just agree that people uh, are definitely like they're given the easy road and of course, if you're given the easy road uh, uh, most times, then you're generally going to expect uh, an easy outlet. And, you know, high school is all about cutting corners uh, for a lot of people. And being quite- get to those college parties faster. Yeah, exactly. You got to gotta get to your car, you know, maybe that you're just driving so you can go buy that breakfast burrito across the street. I know that's a uh, that was what a and lot of us lived live for those ninety nine cent time. breakfast burritos, dollar twenty nine oh, yeah. breakfast burritos, whatever they ended up as. Oh man, yeah. get three of those, smash them back, man. We we work the system so much, they they change the way they they make those sandwiches forever at that deli. Uh, true story. <laughs> so yeah, um, if there's a will, there's a way with with high schoolers, so 
definitely figure That's out true. how to get out of um a awkward situation in school if they want to just leave they'll leave it's not saying they won't so uh having having this dynamic is important which you mentioned yeah i actually really like this um this second sentence here um you know even with all the promises of ai it's important that we take the time to talk about artificial intelligence in the classroom absolutely not only do we teach content but we serve as mentors facilitators of learning and co-learners with our students so i feel like this article is going to touch on a lot of what i was just talking about where teachers need to be more directly involved and ai tools are kind of creating this gap in the learning system right now and we need to remove that gap where teachers assign work, kids go plug it into chat GPT, go plug it into an AI, and we don't have to worry about it. It's a problem to solve. It's like, wow, homework completion rate's 100% lately. That's so weird. That's, I wonder why. I think, you uh, know, a, 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 not to fully cut you off, I just, the, oh, the, um, it would almost be beneficial if they would just show the students how to do it themselves. Show them how GPT works. Show them how the AI works. Be like, look, yeah, we it's out there. There's nothing to say you can't access this from your house, uh, from wherever. And, and it's it's just a – it's generally not something that threatens the academic student because you are able to interpret – just like this machine, the information that you are perceived, and if they it better, if they could spin it in a way that helps you better understand your biology in the situation, I think that would be beneficial. You know, you're a processing yeah. unit. We could almost uh, like help people understand that use ChatGPT. ChatGPT is a faster Google. Don't don't because yes. rather than skimming through multiple pages. And checking sources and everything else, check ChatGPT. Check ChatGPT. It not only sums up all of multiple sources, it also provides you with the sources. So you can go and check and do an in-depth dive if you really needed to. So you can literally ask ChatGPT, can I get a source for this information? And it will give you a series of links. So you can go and acquire the information at its source if you really want to do the deep dive. ChatGPT is basically just fast Google. But don't treat it as a tool to write your entire essay, just the same as you wouldn't go on to spark notes and copy and paste an entire essay. You know, it's not that type of tool. So teach people. Uh, and that's actually what this next sentence uh, I was just reading ahead here says, it's important that we help our students learn about the benefits of them and also show how to use these tools properly, responsibly, and ethically. And I very much agree. And I think that directly relates to our sentiment there. Uh, oh, I actually didn't. I skipped over this first point. I love that. Personalized learning is something that quantum computing and large language models will actually do really well at. Once they're developed, you would be able to understand better how each student needs a personalized learning plan and to better deliver the content to them. I actually really like that. Let's see what they say about this. Uh, educators will be able to provide tailored learning experiences based on AI-driven analytics, yet yeah, that provide valuable insights into student performance and learning trends. Using this data, AI can instantly adapt student learning materials, and teachers can use this information to provide personal learning experiences adapting to each student's strengths, weaknesses, and learning pace. It, exactly what I thought it would be. That's actually amazing. Yeah, no, that, that's That really would cool. be awesome for someone like me, you know? It, you know, moments of hyper focus and then moments of rest and then moments of hyper focus and moments of rest moments of hyper focus moments of rest in a cycle and it's like as long as you can have that stimulation it'd be more engaging than here's a tiny trickle of content and then eventually you'll get a whole bunch when we start a new unit and then nothing and then nothing and then nothing it's like it doesn't work for everyone no no i i agree with that it ties in with some personal developments uh, of the past um, like, yeah, I don't think we even need to touch base on productivity and efficiency. We understand exactly why it's going to improve productivity and efficiency. If they don't have to do all the extra nonsense paperwork that teachers have to do right now, 
the like the administrative oh attendance and all of this and the distribution of tests and the digitizing of the tests and all this nonsense if that can all be ai driven that would be much more practical for the teachers so i pretty much cut and dry on productivity and efficiency yes. um creating and supplementing content though sub, uh, through ai powered platforms powered platforms Teachers can curate a range of educational resources. With generative AI in particular, teachers are able to create lessons, activities, assessments, prompts for discussion, and presentations simply by providing a short prompt with keywords. That's actually a good point. And you can make a more interactive discussion based on those prompts and based on the visual tools that are being developed. Yeah, I think there's great potential in all that. And these are actually like the tools themselves uh, yeah, so yeah, audio yeah. pen is a device where I've been using voice to text to write blogs, the writer of this article, not me personally, books, emails, and lesson plans. This is an AI powered web app that you can use on your computer or phone. The app takes your words and enhances them as it generates the text, which you can edit as needed. That's handy. So it's a script generator. That's really cool. Canva Magic Rate. Uh, Canva now offers AI text to image generator called Magic Rate, uh, which can inspire creativity in writing, provides ideas, helps with brainstorming, and supports lesson planning, making it a useful tool for educators for creating presentation of other graphics for classrooms use. Okay, so exactly, I was just talking about the previous point, but more visual. Uh, so I think it's uh, fair to say that the AIs are definitely prevalent and and uh, being a resource out there and. I think in the education scope of things, uh, it's it's yeah. It looks like they have a lot of the tools. School. Looks like a lot of these tools that we were talking about that would be beneficial. They actually are starting to develop or are already developed. Like with quizzes, teachers could design quizzes that will create a personalized learning path based on students' responses. That's actually kind of yeah, cool. That's great. Yep, this is all uh stuff like partly why scrap my business idea like i love the concept but this this shows this proves that what i i thought was happening was happening i called it basically um a little bit too late the, to the bubble basically i'm not i'm not capable of producing an ai <laughs> uh, just quite frankly i'm not i'm not a brainiac like that i am not techie like that if i maybe knew sooner and, and had understood the real effect that an AI directly could have. Um, maybe I, I would have gone into uh, coding more actually, but I just, I just didn't understand it at that time. AI wasn't even a discussion. It was a sci-fi Oh, game. so if, so if you had the resources presented to you in an educational facility, you may have engaged more with the concept. Precisely. I'm a product <laughs> of the problem. Uh, I think we can probably skip off of that resource, though. There we go. Well, no, that was a great uh, demonstration to pull up for an article. And uh, I think highlighted yeah. a lot of the, the values that both systems struggle with right now. Yeah, and it's good to see that there are tools in development. Obviously, people are, are thinking about these things just as, as we are today, that you know, there's there's issues out there today that we need to deal with. And clearly, uh, people in the educational field are using the tools that we're creating as a society to benefit themselves as much as they can, as much as you know, the school boards and education boards aren't really providing a lot of resources for them. It seems teachers, as always, are being resourceful and taking it upon themselves to provide education to students. Yeah, and, and if anything, uh, if you can pull anything as a student from this, you know, respect your, your teachers. It, I think there's a, a point that I failed. Well, there is a point that I failed to bring up, and it's the thing that I find important to understand is I think the educators should have a level of discipline as well. So if you're a student say I, i'm johnny and as johnny i'm i'm trying to I'm get johnny. into algebra you know i i don't know how to do algebra i don't i don't know what those symbols are um so 
And here Johnny is trying to connect with that class. Uh, but we have John Brown. John Brown, Mr. Brown, he's he's a uh, teacher. He does math. Now, Johnny doesn't agree with John about a math problem. And uh, Mr. Brown here is, well, you, you're just you're just missing the, the point. You know, you need to you need to study harder. Uh, Johnny suggests that Mr. Brown bring a new teaching style to the classroom. Mr. Brown's like, take a hike. You know, I don't I don't I don't teach that way. Yeah, you can you can find another teacher if you don't like my teaching style. But when you're here in my classroom, I teach this way. That kind of stuff has happened in the past with people. Definitely. It's happened I with think me that in my workplace. The, well, I, I believe that. But the the thing to pull from it is you can't separate the curriculum from the engagement in the class. So if there's different ways to learn that have been presented uh, through the internet and through different mediums, it's almost your job as an educator to update your sense of teaching style to accommodate for the knowledge presented. And if you're not, you're either, in my opinion, ignorant, uh, you really do believe and are passionate that your system is better. Um, you don't get paid enough to care, <laughs> which is a valid point. I do not want to say that as a joke or anything. Teachers don't get paid enough. I, I, I agree. No, truly, it's hard to be motivated to do that amount of work, to, to be that stressed, to have work for nine months of the year, to not have work for three months of the year, and then to just struggle basically day in and day out is is demoralizing. Yeah, and, and you know what? Again, like, this is no shame. This is not, I'm not trying to say this next point with any shame to these teachers that are passionate and struggling and simply because they're just, they're in a tough spot. But there, it is not to say that there aren't ignorant teachers and those things don't exist. And when they do, when a student doesn't have control over that situation, it's very uncomfortable to go to school. And it, it just, if you could have control and in a sense where you are allowed to vote on what even maybe those teachers are teaching, just the style that they're teaching, uh, maybe you're not able to necessarily get them out of there, but if it's so bad and you have the majority of the class that, that objects to this teacher's way of, of teaching, maybe they'd vote, you know, hey, please remove this this teacher from our classroom. We don't feel comfortable. We're not gaining our our the knowledge that we're supposed to be receiving. If it's your right to education, they're stripping you of your right. So. I think education should be competitive and that's that's what I've vouched for for years. I, I don't think having a competitive teaching staff is a bad thing because even if it's friendly competition, um, it would provide an atmosphere where, oh, it, is my content for English today going to be fun like uh, Joe Schmo's content and uh, creative writing, you know, he, they all did this project where they did poetry and they shared their poetry. That's a fun project. Here I have a, an essay on a book and maybe this is boring for my class. Maybe I'll have them make a, a poet poem uh, based off of that essay and, you know, get them to stimulate what they created and, and how they can approach it in a different way. That's the kind of stuff that we want to see in a, a school environment. We don't want to see the, okay, let's refer to our computers and make sure you follow protocol and, and sign yeah, in the right exactly. way. Yeah, exactly. Let, let's, let's read Dying of the Light by Maya Angelou on the computer versus, okay, we just read To Kill a Mockingbird. Here are three different concepts that you, or three different ideas that you can come and present with. One is, 
a creative writing piece. One is a poem. One is, you know, a diorama or something like that. Give people multiple different artistic options uh, to be able to, to meet the academic criteria that you're trying to set for them. And I think on that note that I've, I've pretty much exhausted most of what I have to say uh, about our educational systems and the changes that I've seen or that I've liked to seen. Do you have any points on how you feel we could improve the educational system? Just to wrap it up, to kind of summarize the, today's episode of what would be positive changes or even recognizing positive changes in today's system? I would just say having a sense of um, having a sense of self understanding what you need out of your educational journey if that's discipline just get discipline don't worry about the english don't worry about the the history the science the, the extra factors involved with those um, just try to balance in a way that you can control and if you can break down those sections that you control into something that's understandable then you're learning that's the process of learning. Learning's not, it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be complicated. The whole point of learning effectively is breaking it down to a place of understanding. Maybe that takes simplicity. Maybe that takes time and, and critical thinking to be able to break it into a, a simple form. But simplicity does not mean stupidity. And that's just a value I would instill in, in people trying to understand the system because a lot of things do feel like stu uh, stupidity rather than simplicity and you realize sometimes it's it's simple and it's stupid simple because it's simply yeah it's it's simply building blocks upon other things that you're going to understand down the road yep yeah, yeah i 100 percent agree um you said it very well that it's Things are, they seem stupid, like simply stupid, basically. But in reality, it's just that they are, they need to be dumbed down to that because everything else, as you said, they're foundational concepts. You know, that is the very core of what you need to learn. And we're building on top of that. So that's, that's well said in that regard. Um, Thank you. No, I, I think, I think that, oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say, I think we've uh, had some really good points established today. Yeah, yeah, it was an excellent discussion. I was happy to have this today. No, likewise. And, and honestly, I appreciate you being here. Um, there's a lot in store for this next episode that we have coming. We're going to try to get a guest on with our panel and and start exploring some options between what we can discuss with another person involved and have some fun with that. Bring some fun uh, art to the project soon. We're working on some designs for different avenues to explore creativity with our episode format we're trying to have engagement portions with uh testimonies and and different topics maybe guest submitted questions for uh someone in a certain industry you know if you wanted to submit a question for a food guru a food critic um, and we had a food critic on the show we could refer to that list and be like oh okay this this came from um a you critic, food critic. Food. yeah you were a critique critic. the hell out of food that, that was that was a very ironic example <laughs> um i didn't mean Isn't to do a food that critic i critique food all the time i got yeah, you yeah. I critique oh, yeah. all my own cooking the restaurants cooking chef cooking <laughs> yeah we got this <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> we'll critique but, some food um uh, there's um there's a lot of good things in store and, and we're learning our process better we're 
uh, figuring out the kind of engagement we're hoping to gather from this project. And, and honestly, don't be afraid to reach out. This project will only improve with the more engagement we have with folks. We're based off of you. We're based off of our interactions with you. And don't don't hesitate to suggest a avenue of exploration for us to undertake because we're willing to do some research. Hope this show today proves that we're actively trying to improve the quality of what we're presenting to you. We do not want to just present our opinion alone. We do want to actually bring resources that you can utilize and help gather your senses through. And I really do personally appreciate you guys joining us today for this intellectual adventure. And I would just like to add, if you do want to get in contact with us on the podcast, check out intellectualadventure doc, or intellectualadventurepodcast.com and there's a contact us page there where you can go find out how to get in contact with us directly. That's where you can put any submissions and we'll change that avenue potentially down the line. But for now, that's how you can get in contact with us and submit ideas for things you'd like to see in the future. Uh, avenues, if you would like to make a guest appearance, if you think you offer something to the show that you could bring and you'd love to share with people, I'd be happy to hear about that as well. But for now, thank you for joining us on another intellectual adventure. 